Imagine you're having one of those mornings. After a restless night's sleep, thinking about all the answers to potential interview questions that you're going to face later that day, you wake up late to the sound of crashing bowls coming from the kitchen and a tiny little, uh-oh. You creep into the kitchen slowly, only to find half a bottle of milk spilled all over the countertops, evidence that your kids are trying to make breakfast. So you're running late after spending the morning not only cleaning up the mess, but going very slowly and showing how to, how to do that breakfast making properly. You get to school and your daughter doesn't want to let go of your leg as you bring her into class. And so as you make your way back to your car, your head is thinking you're late and this is a, for a very important date. You're about to go for this interview of your dream job. And as you make your way in your car along the road, you manage to hit every single red light on your way there. So you pull up and you finally find a car spot and you hop out of the car. How long is it going to take you when your mind and your emotions are already distracted by the morning's events and by the interview that you're just about to walk into. How long is it going to take you to work out whether you're safe to park there or when you come back to the car, you're either going to get a ticket or a towed car? How much cognitive load are you putting yourself through in order to parse and determine what this means? Now imagine you're doing the same, having the same morning, but you're in Los Angeles in 2015. And instead of being presented with the multiple traffic signs, you've got this version in front of you. How much time now are you going to spend working out whether you can park? Which one, when your mind is already distracted, not focused on the act of parking, focused on the different tasks that you've got to do for that day. How much effort would you like to go through in doing something simple as parking your car? Now, if you're like me, I would much prefer the sign on the right because it's taken all of the effort that it would have taken me to work out that and displayed it simply. It's taken the effort to actually redesign and rethink and reimagine how that information could be presented better. It's taken the complications out of the system and presented this information simply so that I could just get on with my job at a time when I don't want to be focused on that as being my sole responsibility. And really, that's what I want to talk to you today about. I've been a software consultant for the last 16 years at ThoughtWorks, and I've visited with many, many com uh, companies and clients. And throughout my journey as a software developer, as a coach, as an architect, as a CTO coach, um, there's one thread that unites all of my experiences, and that is being able to take and synthesize complications and complex thinking um, into something simple that's easily consumable for the masses. And so today I stand in front of you with a crusade. And my crusade is to say this. We work with complex systems all the time. Why the hell do we make things more complicated for ourselves? Let's strive for simplicity. Let's go the extra effort that it does take to aim for simplicity so we can get the extra benefits out of it. So today, I am here to inspire you. I am here to ignite this passion for simplicity within you so you too can strive for simplicity. 
And I'll be doing that by firstly ignoring technology and thinking, taking a look at the outside world. And let's think about how other industries handle complexity. Then let's think about some of the complex, uh, sorry, some of the consequences of not simplifying. And then a little bit of a look at how did we get here before we really start thinking about how we can do little things in our own jobs to keep our world around us simple. So let's take a journey thinking about the world around us and dealing with complexity in the real world. If I was to ask you to think about the most complex system that you could think of, one that an error in it can be fatal, one that takes many, many years for someone to be a proficient uh, person who can look after the system. I bet you're all thinking about this, our own bodies. Our own bodies are this complex mass um, of um, uh, organs and nerves and brain matter. It takes professionals in the medical field at least 10 years to be proficient enough to keep our lives healthy and strong and, uh, um, and, and our hearts beating, which is fantastic because if you had a heart attack in hospital, you're right there, right? If you had a heart attack in the hospital, it's the best place to have a heart attack because the cardiologists are on hand. They've had multiple years um, experience dealing with your heart attack. But what happens if you have a heart attack on the street when these trained professionals are not around? Well, in the 80s, the medical profession decided that they wanted to increase the chances of survival for someone who has a heart attack um, or any other type of medical emergency outside of a hospital setting. So they devised this. Doctors A, B, C, and then later they added the D. As a way to simplify the life-giving um, instructions to the masses. So now, if you go into any swimming pool, any office building, you'll probably find a sign that's like this. So if you know someone falls uh, unconscious on the, on the street or is having an medical emergency, you'll know, know all the steps if you just remember doctors A, B, C, D. Danger, response, send for help. What more if you, uh, beyond just remembering the uh, mnemonic for it, you see the poster. It's very clear. It's got the instructions quite clearly on it as to what you need to do in order to follow these instructions. It's simple, it's clear, it does not take a person 10 years to understand how to give immediate life-saving um, uh, responses to someone in need. What's more, the medical field has gone one step further because that compression rate needs to be done at a certain beats per minute because the heart needs to be pumping at a certain beats per minute and it has to be pretty accurate to get the compression rates. But in an emergency, when your brain is thinking about how to bring that person back to life, how are you going to get the right rhythm? Well, again, they've told us, just do this. Ah, 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 stand alive, stand alive, ah, 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 stand alive, you will get it every time. If you could just sing that song to yourself, and if you didn't know that, now you know. And if someone has a medical emergency outside and you need to do it, just sing that song. I mean, you could also sing another one, Bites the Dust. It's the same rhythm, but <laughs> choose your own. So if the medical industry has been able to find a way at being able to give life-saving skills to everybody by producing a way to simplify and to, um, for us to be able to respond immediately in a highly um, emotional time, surely we can do the same. Surely we can apply some of this simplification techniques to the world that we, that we live in. But what if, so, what if we don't? Think about some of the consequences of not simplifying. Now, I'm sure you've all worked with complicated systems. 
systems that, yes, they were a complex world, but there's just complications built in there that we don't need. Things that we do just because it's the way that we've done. What are some of the consequences that we've got? Well, um, let's think about maintenance, the cost of maintenance. A system that is really hard to understand is hard to add code to. Hard, if it's hard to add code to, we've increased our time to value. A system that's hard to add code to is more likely to have defects as well. So it's more likely to go out at 2 a.m. and you have to be on pager duty. Who wants to be on pager duty on a system that is so complicated, it takes you a moment or two just to wake up to be able to respond to it? How quick is your brain going to turn on if you have to then start having some highly complex understanding and thinking when it comes to resolving the, the outage and the problem? So we've got consequences of time to value, consequences for mean time to recover, consequences of cost. We also have onboarding costs. So it's not just the cost of keeping it up. How long does it take to, to onboard a new person into your team to, un, to help them understand where the system is, what the system does, what the business language is that we're trying to solve, what are the problems that we're trying to solve? How much time is that onboarding cost costing your organisation? And then, if we look, step back and think at a macro level, who remembers Alta Vista? And then, if anyone remembers Alta Vista, you remember that that was a really complicated way to be able to find information on the net. Along comes Google with a very simple UI. There's the type of UI standard that we now just naturally work towards. They simplified everything that Altavis tried to do and just have one text button. So what's the cost of not simplifying for AltaVista? Well, where's AltaVista today? So the, the cost is quite high for organizations at both a micro and a macro uh, level. So it is something that we need to address and it is something that we need to do both for personal harmony with the way that we work and interact with the systems, but also for the bottom, do uh, for the bottom line. Now, it wouldn't be 2023 without some reference to ChatGPT, right? So in order to help me research what are the case studies, real world case studies that I could bring to this audience to show more than just you know, my Google example, some of the examples I'm gonna show later, well, Google, uh, ChatGPT, sorry, it says that there's many. I, I started to go in a little bit of a rabbit hole researching each of these ones. And each of them have a really fantastic story about where the complications sort of started to creep in and pile up and pile up, so much so that it has these uh, macroeconomic um, consequences of the disasters cause due to the consequences of not, not simplifying. By the way, ChatGPT is actually a useful tool that I've been using recently just to chuck some ideas in there that helps me synthesize some of the, my thoughts and my processing. But how do we get here? Now, I'm gonna take a pause from my crusade and my inspiration in you know, inviting you to join my, my crusade and just think a little bit about why we're in this position that we're in the position. We're gonna pause that for a second because you've just probably had your coffee, you've had your morning tea, your brains are probably wired up, ready to go. So I'm gonna give a little bit of a quiz, all right? Now, I've done this quiz in Brisbane, in Sydney, and in Melbourne. No one's got the right answer yet. But I've heard Perth, there's a pretty, <laughs> A bit smarter than us over there on the East Coast, right? So I'm pretty sure you guys are going to get the answer. Now, this is, this is the, the quiz. I've got a pattern in my head. 268, match my pattern. I need you to tell me what my pattern is. And as I said, I'm pretty sure that you guys will get it. There'll be someone in the audience that can get it, right? 134 answers the pattern. So tell me, Perthlings, who's smart? Who knows what this pattern is? Awesome. 
All right, give me another pattern that matches. 257. You got it now? Yeah? Cool. All right, 158 also matches, right? Right? Awesome, cool. So this is the pattern, ascending numbers. Yeah? You got it? Awesome. Right? All right, so if we back up for a second, how many people saw the first 268 and thought, hmm, 2 plus 6 equals 8, could be it. How many then went, yeah, 1 plus 3 equals 4, that's right on the money. And 2 plus 5 equals 7, yeah? Uh, uh, did I trick you on this one? And then did you say, oh right, so it's A plus B equals C except when, it's odd numbers, except when, except when. How often in our life do we do this? How often in our life do we take a piece of information, we come up with a hypothesis, we find other bits of information that help match it, but then when we get a piece of uh, rivaling information, one that doesn't quite make it work, we mould and we change and we make our, our hypothesis a little bit more complex, a little bit more complicated in order to match the information that we have at hand. Well, there's a reason why we do this. And it's because our brains are pretty stupid. Well, they're not stupid, they're just old. And it's because they've been evolved from times when seeing spots in a forest coming at you, your brains needed to quickly pattern match that to say, that's a cheetah coming towards me, I better run. So our brains have got these things called cognitive biases. And there's many, many cognitive biases, but a couple that are at play here are congruence bias, confirmation bias, and distortion of information. So we can take all this information at us, we ignore some lots of information that don't quite meet our hypothesis. We get to our hypothesis really, really quickly, and once we hold on to that hypothesis, every new information that comes at it, instead of changing our hypothesis, we change the facts. We make things a little bit more complicated around that initial hypothesis. And we don't search for um, validation or invalidation of our hypothesis. We don't actively go looking for examples that disproves our hypothesis. And so we build up more and more complications in the way that we think about the world. And we do this, and so our brain is actively working against us, and that's the problem. Our brain is actually there to make things more complicated than they need to be. If we think about how that comes out in our everyday world, well, uh, paradox, paradox of choice. In the, in the book, Paradox of Choice, we hear you know, the stories of the 50 different jam jars that are on the shelf in the, um, in the shop. We're paralyzed by that choice. There's too much choice. There's too many things that, that we need to stop and think about. That cognitive load on our system is too high for us to process at the time when we've got heightened emotions and heightened mental load. When do we have heightened emotions and heightened mental load? Well, when there's outages in our system, when the system has gone down at 2 a.m. and our brains actually aren't firing on all cylinders, when we have to do so many things. Michael talked about the slack time in the team, but how much slack time do we really, really get and how much delivery pressure do we usually uh, take ourselves under? So at times when our uh, mental capacity to take on new information is at an all-time low, we keep on adding to that, and this just builds up. So it does take effort and it does take time for us to slow down and to simplify the world. So if that's the case, and that's the case in the world around us, how does it transform into the world around us in our day-to-day -day life? Well, I want you to think about this. Does this work? Does this resonate with you? You have your first requirement coming in. Good. Then you have your next requirement coming in. It's a little bit differently shaped, but you can deal with that. And then your next requirement comes in, and your next requirement comes in, and so on and so forth, until you stop, and if you stare back, this is the shape that you have. 
But if you paused for a second and just took a breath and thought about what you really had, you might be able to find a simple way through and a different shape to rearrange the information that you've got. And so this is something that I see time and time again. All these stories come in creeping in. Um, our code keeps on being added to. Our design keeps on being incrementally changed and evolved over time. But we don't usually allow ourselves the time to sit back and think and reflect in these micro moments to work out what we're actually building. Now, I'm sure everyone in this room is doing TDD, right? How, what do you do for TDD? You write a test that fails, then you write some code that makes it pass. Then you write a test that fails, and then you write a code, the test, uh, code that makes it pass. And then you write a test that fails, and then you write some code that makes it pass, and oh my gosh, I forgot a step. I forgot the step, which is refactor. Because actually, TDD was meant to be write a test, write some code, refactor. Write a test, write some code, refactor. Write a test, write a code, and refactor. And because most people forget that refactor state and every single line of code that they're adding, we miss out on those micro moments that we can take to simplify our code. Yes, maybe that first lot of code that you added to make the test pass makes the test pass and you can move on to do the rest of the story. But without taking a pause and making sure that you're using the right variable in there, whether you might want to change that Boolean to an actual object and take that half a second longer right now, we miss the chance of making these micro-moment refactorings within our code, and they build up and they build up. I know because I'm working in a service line that deals with legacy modernization, and we see this time and time again, 15-year systems that have had this um, neglect of refactoring in these micro-moments. So then you have to make a business case to go up to the board to say, can we please refactor our code? It doesn't work because we don't take those breath, we don't take the breath within our code uh, as we're writing and as we're forming to try and work out is that the simplest way that we can um, that we can write that code. So we're con if we take a moment, it's one way that we can always start to bake in these micro moments of simplicity. So I want to tell you about a couple of different ways because by now I'm hoping that you are at least interested enough to join my crusade, but you know, just a little bit skeptical as to how you can actually do it on your, on your project. So I'm going to take you through a couple of different ways that you can actually apply this in your day-to-day -day life. So that's step number one. Take the micro moments when you can, apply TDD as it is actually written, include that refactor step, and just constantly stop and think about what you're writing and if it still makes sense. Or is there a different way that you can parcel up this information and package it together? Now, another way that I've seen is to have anti-corruption layers. Who's heard of anti-corruption layers? It's brilliant. You have really shiny, beautiful code on the outside and the big mess inside the box. Now, I think that, does, that is a technique that really works well. So you've been able to be able to simplify the world around it usually works very well in complex places where you have to have specialization with, of knowledge within a certain section, but the rest of it can be nice and simple. Because if you're working in a really complex field, sometimes you actually can't get to a simple answer. Sometimes when it comes to um, understanding and, and transferring the understanding of the, the, what the system that you have that you're working with, you do need expertise. It's just like, if someone falls and crashes in the street, that a, doctors A, B, C, D, that will get them to the point where you can get to the medical expert. So sometimes you do need that expertise within the team. And you can actually contain that complexity and the complications into a little box uh, so that the rest of the team doesn't necessarily need to deal with it. And it is an effective technique that I have seen but I will also caution with that. Um, it is often that little box or that container of that complexity and that complications, it's the second drawer in the kitchen. No one really wants to touch it. It's a big mess and it's a big problem when you actually have to do. You've got to take the whole drawer apart to find that what you want. So use this 
with a little bit of caution around you. So that's two techniques. TDD, anti-corruption layers, containerizing your complications, pushing them into a box and hoping you never have to look peep into that box again. I'm going to tell you a story about a uh, project that I was on early in my career. And honestly, to this day, I'm still working out whether I made it simple or I made it too complex. We were creating a form, and it was a multi-page form. So instead of designing the code based around each individual forms, I decided to model it after form itself. So lots of input fields, form, pages, uh, validation. It was written in C Sharp. And as a Ruby developer, I kind of didn't like the constraints of it that the typed language was giving me. And that was simple enough. I could make everything an object and pass objects around. <laughs> so we created, created this very uh, sophisticated DSL that would consume uh, the input values inside the code. We didn't need to worry about what if it was a string or a number or a uh, checkbox. And then the UI would handle a little bit of the, um, the, the um, working out whether it was a checkbox type or a string type. Now, that was simplified it completely. And I, I was retelling this story to somebody uh, yesterday, and they were telling me about this configuration complexity clock, where we start with hard value numbers on the 12 o'clock, and then we move into, is it configuration files, uh, configuration values on the 3 o'clock, and then we move into rules engine at the 6 o'clock, and then uh, DSLs on the, on the 9 o'clock. And then we come all the way back to hard code values because the DSLs are getting a little bit more complicated. Now, I retell this story as a cautionary tale of someone who does still try and aim for simplicity, but sometimes we overcorrect and we go a little bit too complicated and we think that we're making things a lot simpler. Oh, but really, to the people that came after us on that project, it was really complicated for them to understand. So what's the lesson here? Well, sometimes you just have to take a step back and actually ask after what is the simplicity that we're actually striving for and are we meeting the mark? And we can gauge that by adding new people to our team. So every new person that comes to our team, we can gauge how long it takes to onboard them. If it starts to drag out or if they just don't understand where to put the code, that's a really good sign and a signal to us to say, hey, look, maybe if we're actually had something a little bit more complicated than it needs to be. Maybe we should simplify it. And just do a little bit of refactor in there to make it a bit more simple. So that's another way. Bringing new people into our team and getting them to question because they're looking with fresh eyes and a fresh, fresh perspective. So now, now I'll tell you a, a, a fourth way. And I want to start with a little bit of a story. We got to this client and I was working with them as an agile coach, uh, and they were adding new elements to the UI. It took the team two weeks to add a checkbox. Kid you not, two weeks to add a checkbox to the screen. I went hunting, because I thought, how could it possibly take someone two weeks to add a checkbox to a screen? Well, this is what I found. I found complicated code really hard to understand, multiple inheritance layers that were just really difficult to manage through. I also found that any design that we had to do had to go through this one person who was actively stopping any refactoring within the teams. I got really curious then. Because why would someone actively stop us refactoring that piece of code that would take two weeks to add a checkbox to the screen? What was really going on here? What I found was pretty interesting. This person was a contractor. And that contractor was getting some on a really good monetary incentive to keep his contract. And his contract was really, really safe. Do you know why? 
Because every single change that had to go through that system had to be vetted by him. Because he was the only person in the organisation who really understood how everything hung together. So no change, no business person was ever wanting anything done without his involvement. He was the king of the, of, of, of the organisation. Anyway, he was on a pretty penny on that contract and would not go to full time. So what happened? You've got these full time employees that were held hostage to this one person. And why? Because he had power. His power and his uh, position within the company was tied to the fact that he owned the understanding of this. So, what did I do? I democratised that knowledge. I started to refactor the code. I got approval to refactor the code, but as a consultant, we sometimes get more approval of people, than people on the ground. So we refactor that code. We democratised that knowledge. I started to do, run boot camps in understanding the domain so everyone in the team could understand what we were doing, how what they were working on was impacting the system around them and really just understanding the business that they were working with. So by democratising that power and taking that away from that one individual, boy, he got mad, but certainly we gave the value back to that company because everyone was then able to start thinking about the ways that they could simplify it. Uh, and the complications within that system, we went from two weeks for, to add a checkbox to two hours. And that's really what we're trying to get to, decreasing that time to value because we've removed all that complications out. So. If you find there is a person of power in your organisation who is hoarding that knowledge because it's really um, useful for them personally, start to think about how you can democratise that information. Because if you can start explaining to everybody how the system works, you will naturally start to simplify the world around you. Okay. So that's five methods now that we've been talking about. TDD um, is, a, is, a, is a great one. And TDD is great when you use conjunction with business language. So who's worked, who's worked in, a com in, a, in overseas countries? Uh, I, worked at, I, I, I worked in the UK once. We speak English, but we don't speak English. We think we're saying the same things, but we don't say the same things. Now, anyone who's worked with a Brazilian understands if you say, I'm going to wear some thongs to the office, you're going to get a pretty crazy look from my, from my Brazilian friends. I uh, was working in London, and I saw a pair of jeans on the table, and I innocently said, who's running around with their pants off? Only to find out that pants in the UK was a how they talk about underwear. Completely different story there. So, we think we're saying the same, the same thing, but we're not saying the same language. And what happens when we have um, teams where we have not cross-functional teams, when you have business teams in one corner and technology teams in, one, in another corner? So they tend to work and talk about different, uh, at different layers. So, for example, I was working in a publishing company and I had a good old conversation with the business folks and they were talking to me about authors and they were talking to me about publish dates and publications and articles and blog posts. And so when I went to the code, I'm expecting to find all those elements in there, but no, I found database records, I found DAOs, I found UI-related um, concepts. Because the language that was written in the code was not the language that the business was talking. And what problems did that cause? Well, a defect came through. A defect said this author was trying to add um, this uh, description to this blog post or this, this um, article that they were writing. And here is the defect that came from that. Now, we had to have a translation layer between all of that they were talking about and our code to even understand where in the code to start looking. Because we had these two different languages being used between two different tribes within the organisation. But if we start to simplify and start to think about the same language, using the same language across, we'd find that we can start coding towards the language that the business is using. 
who's heard of ubiquitous language and DDD? This is great, this is a good audience for that. Because ubiquitous language provides the team with one language to use. We spend a lot of time to understand the terminologies and introduce um, the business level concepts into the teams. That's step number one, speak the same language. Because once we start speaking the same language, we can lose some of these translation barriers. Step number two is start using the, that, those terms within our code base. So we can start renaming, doing simple refactors. You open a file, do a refactor, as you're adding code, commit all of that. And you know, tools like ReSharper and um, IntelliJ really simplify the ability for us to do those micro-level uh, refactors. So we can then start getting our code looking very similar to the language that we're using. And then we start breaking down this translation, which removes the cognitive load that our teams are under as they're trying to uh, fix and diagnose issues, but also add new concepts. Because we don't, we, we lose, that um, translation that needs that, that we need. And we also can, again, onboard people easily into the teams because we are all just talking the one language. We don't have to have two sets of concepts. So when I started introducing Ubiquitous Language and DDD to this organisation, the first thing that we did was write a, a big mapping on the table, uh, on the whiteboard, and we, gave, we printed out little palm cards um, that people, the developers could keep on the desk that would try and do the translation for us. And then we could bring them back uh, as we started to refactor. We could always refer to those translation files and then start to talk in the one language. So DDD, ubiquitous language. These are concepts that we've been talking at Yale for many, many years. That's another tool in our toolbox that we can use on a daily basis to start bringing some of this simplification to our, to our uh, workplace. Now, as I said, I, I'm a consultant, and I usually go into organizations, and the first thing I do is ask the teams, can you draw the architecture? Take me through it. Tell me what we've got. What are the systems, and where are they living? Now, I usually end up with this at the end of the session. Who's guilty? Who has this as their architecture diagram? Bit of a mess, really tricky to understand. And if it's tricky to understand, it's really difficult to communicate. And the complications that are in there are infinite. Now, again, if you've been coming to Yale for a couple of years, you probably have heard of the thing, the next technique that I'm going to talk to you about. Because Simon Brown has been speaking, um, Simon Brown came, uh, oh, has, been, has been a Yale uh, presenter a couple of times. So you've probably heard of the C4 technique. But for those who don't uh, know about the C4 technique, let me just quickly explain. It's like taking a series of maps. You're treating your architecture like a series of maps. So when we first start talking about the 10,000 foot, really high level view, we're taking out a big picture of the world. And we're just plotting where all the countries live, where all the big systems live. But if I really want to know where Simon Brown lives in New Jersey, I then have to take out a view of the UK. And again, on the UK, I need to see that it's right down in the south in the, in the English Channel. But again, if I really, really want to know where Sun Brown is, because I baked a cake and I don't want to egg a salad, I want to deliver from a cake, I then have to go to a street level view. But as we go down to each different layer of detail, we're looking and zooming in further and further. We don't lose any information because all of the different maps that we're building up around us are still there, still referenceable. They just don't need to be on the same whiteboard or on the same page. Now, I challenged my team recently to take C4 and actually do C4 as a post-it. So we would draw our milestone and the thing that we're developing, and then on post-its, we would put the diagrams, which was another constraining way for us to aim for the simplicity and think about how we can simplify our systems. And the final technique that I can impart on you in your crusade to go to simplicity is think about the focus of the information. Now, as a, if you've learned about psychology thinking, you'll understand that sometimes we need to specialise on things and sometimes we need to zoom out and focus on being really generalist. So, and that, this change of focus, like taking a camera lens 
and uh, change in the picture helps us with that pattern matching. So it helps us consider all the possibilities on a really wide generalist scale and then zoom into a hypothesis that could work for us. And when we get different information, again, take a general view, expand back out, and then we might find a completely different way we can zoom in. And constantly be thinking about this zoom out, zoom in approach allows us to land on different, other simpler methods as we get new, method, new facts coming in that can challenge our hypothesis around us. So instead of just layering the facts on and squeezing those facts into a shape that makes us feel good, we can actually stand back, reorganise the facts into something that is a simple view. So, how did I go? How many people are with me on my crusade? How many people would like to join me as we strive for simplicity? Yes it will take effort. Yes, we have to do this on a daily basis. And yes, we have to convince the people around us that it's worthwhile doing. But who's with me? Who here would like to strive for simplicity? Brilliant. Thank you very much.